thanks for spending some time to remember my dad. On September 28th, he would have been 77 years old. His heart gave out this past year, March 1st, 2021. Though we wish his heart would have kept beating for many more years, we're grateful for his full heart that brought much joy to many and was living life to the fullest until its last beat, and a heart that was always up for an adventure. Life with my dad was full of adventures. From traveling to Alaska in a pickup truck, to repelling down waterfalls in Switzerland and off the New River Gorge Bridge in West Virginia, to caving through lava tubes in Chile, I have lots of amazing memories. Some of my favorites come from our visits to Slovenia and Croatia, where my dad told anybody and everybody who would listen that we were looking for lost relatives. With a tiny bit of English, German, and Slovenian or Croatian from a book that he picked up for 25 cents at a yard sale, we eventually did find family in both countries. In Slovenia, they killed a chicken for us for dinner. And in Croatia, we met an entire town full of hersigs. This video is a compilation of more memories representing a small portion of how one life can touch others. There's no particular order to these. Some are humorous, some touching, some inspiring, and all contain a dash of the uniqueness that was Frank Hersig. Thank you to all those who contributed to this memorial video. Your thoughts and stories have brought both laughter and tears and wonderful memories. In the YouTube description below, there's an outline of timestamps that you can click on that will navigate you to an individual person's story. And due to copyright issues, we couldn't play John Denver's Country Roads, but we hope this song runs through your mind as you listen to all the memories. Thank you. My name is Blaze, and one of my favorite memories about Grandpa is when he came into my class and we got to split fern fossils. Everyone thought it was really cool. My name is Wade, and I'll always remember Grandpa Hersig quizzing me on geography questions, and will always remember how he taught us to chop firewood. We'll, we'll miss, miss you, Grandpa! Grandpa. Paul David worked with Frank on selling live edge wood and handcrafted items Paul made from the wood. Paul continues to sell the many items Frank collected for flea markets, and we're very grateful for his help. I've known Frank for over 35 years in many different roles. Uh, first as a teacher uh, and a fellow colleague when I first started out. Uh, my homeroom and study hall was in his room. So of course he had to take time to explain to a, a young shop teacher what a troglodyte was. And Frank would spend most of the time in his room while I was there and we had many, many conversations. Probably the most interesting one was that uh, I told him about my experiences as a college student when we would explore Wind Cave uh, back in the 70s as a bunch of uh, crazy uh, youngsters and uh, he proceeded to tell me how dangerous that was and he's very surprised that he didn't have to come and rescue me sometime. The other way I knew Frank was uh, through athletics uh, when I was a field hockey coach back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, Frank was a timer and I always remember Frank being as excited about every game and about every win as, as everybody else was. We had a great team but then Frank became even more important to myself in Garden Spot when I became the athletic director because Frank is one of the people that you could not have an athletic program without. And most people, including principals, superintendents, have no idea of the importance of, of people like Frank and Frank in particular. Um, he was the uh, football statistician since the start of the program. He uh, officiated track meets. He did uh, hockey, and of course he was uh, the wrestling scorekeeper. And uh, the other thing that Frank really helped us out was when we were asked to do the league wrestling championships at Garden Spot, which we became very well known for, uh, Frank really told us the things we had to do and how it had to be set up because he was so familiar with doing that uh, all those years. And, and we really couldn't have done what we did athletic wise without him. So when I first started coaching, uh, my name was too long for 
the field hockey team to pronounce it. it was like coach right now it was just too much for them to say so they ended up shortening it to tr of course frank was the only person in the world who tr was just too long for and is the only person that simply called me t i was also a uh um, antique self-made aficionado and uh frank was the uh frank Fritz, uh, before there ever was antique uh, archaeology, and um, everybody loved him. He would talk to anybody. He would share his knowledge. And when I was getting rid of my collection, uh, I had Frank and Karen over, and there was no one else that I would have rather had um, take everything that I had and and um, pass it on to other people. And of course, every time we go over to Shoops. Frank was there and he always took time and he always talked to us and we really enjoyed our time with Frank. And I know there's a lot of people from Shooks Grove that, that uh, really enjoyed him and Karen being there. So Frank was, how can I put this, rather frugal. Um, an example was the insulation that blew off the roof of the school that he drove around in his pickup truck and picked up and then took home. Um, the, anytime we had a faculty meeting that had food, Frank was very extremely happy about um, any kind of extra food. Uh, he used the facilities at school uh, to his best ability. But the best stories about Frank uh, is from back in the 80s, uh, Jim Cruz, Greg Hackenberg were coaching football uh, with Denny Hornberger, and um, I would go to the football games and afterwards uh, the whole crew of football workers, coaches, friends, teachers would go down to uh, a, a pub in Leola and, um, and get something to eat and have some beers. And there was two rooms. The back room was all Denny Hornberger and his junior high teacher friends and his coaches. And the front room was Cruz, Hack, myself, uh, Leo Ward, some of the younger people. Uh, and Frank would go back and forth because he would mingle with everybody. And he always asked us to uh, get extra peppers, extra onions, extra anything we could, extra pickles with our subs because Frank never actually bought any food there. He would just come around and eat all the extra things that we ordered uh, while we were there. And the one thing we had to learn to do after a couple of times being out with this group is we would have to sit with our hand over our beer. And the reason we learned to do this is because Frank had a little trick that uh, he would pull his hair out and put it in your beer if you weren't looking. Of course, no one would want to drink that anymore, and so Frank would get a free beer out of it. Uh, and it was just quite amusing, and we'll never forget that. And so, Frank, this is for you. We miss you. This is from a letter from Ron Hersig, Frank's younger brother. I know Karen and Brinton must miss Frank a lot, because I sure do, and wish I could just pick up the phone and talk to him. We always called each other on our birthdays. There are two times that I will never forget. Frank and I went on a three-day adventure to West Virginia to explore Bone Cave and Norman Cave and the Greenbrier River. We stopped at the general store and purchased a pound of hamburger and one dozen eggs. We made our campfire, ate our food, and then we entered and slept in Bone Cave because it's a dry cave. We explored Bone Cave, and then after seeing Bone Cave, we left, and Frank drove through the mountains until we came to a farm with cattle grazing in the fields. Frank stopped the vehicle and opened the gate. After he drove into the field, I closed the gate and we drove approximately 200 feet and stopped. To my surprise, there was a hole in the ground and it happened to be the entrance to Norman Cave. As Frank and I were getting our equipment ready, the cows surrounded us and one big cow was rubbing its neck against the vehicle, actually causing it to rock. After entering Norman Cave, it was amazing to see three different waterfalls inside the earth, and I learned all about stalagmites, stalactites, columns, helictites, ribbons, and other cave formations that day. The second time I will never forget is when Frank invited me to spend the day with him while he was teaching earth science at Garden Spot High School. Frank introduced me to the class as his brother, Ronald Hersig. 
I sat at the back of the room while he was teaching, and every so often some of the students would turn around and give me a quick glance because I so looked so much like Frank. I was amazed as Frank and I were walking down the hallway. Every few seconds, someone would call out, hello, Mr. Hersig, and we would both turn and say hello. It was a pleasure and a great experience for me to see how polite and respectful the students were to Frank. Thoughts from Fred Richter. Stan Landis, Bill Morgan, Frank, and I made up the very first Sugar Shack class. We named our part of the house on Main Street in Kutztown after the Sugar Shack, a popular 1963 song by Jimmy Gilmer and the Fireballs. We ended up at the shack as a result of our sense of humor differing from the Dean of Men's. That's another story. What a wonderful quartet we were. Though I haven't seen Frank for a few years, that, that year made him part of my life forever. I could write a comedic book about Frank's stories from that year in the shack, but my favorite was a story about a snowman. As with so much of his life, when Frank did a job, it was completed with gusto. So it was with the snowman. One snowy afternoon, we built the snowman and over the next few days kept enlarging it. Frank took the leadership in increasing the snowman's size. He'd climb through a window and go out on the house's porch roof to keep adding to the snowman's height. When he finally stopped, the snowman's head was feet higher than the porch roof, up to the sugar shack's second floor. But Frank was still not finished. Night after night, as the weather turned frigid, Frank would crawl through a window with a bucket of water and pour water over the snowman. By the fourth night, the snowman was a six-foot diameter column of solid ice, an ice man. Our landlord decided the ice man was going to fall and damage the house. He decided the ice man must be removed. So he tried to push it over. He couldn't. He got a shovel and tried to chop it down. He couldn't. He got a pick and tried to cut it down. He couldn't. He got his car, tied a chain around the ice man, and tried to pull it down. He couldn't. You can imagine what was going on in the shack with each failed attempt. Frank was hysterical. His handiwork was giving us all a rollicking time. The next day, the landlord returned with a farm tractor and succeeded in toppling the ice man. Though ironically, as it tumbled down, it broke off a piece of the porch. The Iceman story represents so much of what Frank was, fulfilling tasks with exuberance, creativity, persistence, determination, energy, and yes, overachievement even with humor thrown in. I still have a little black cab Frank carved for me when he spent an evening with me while I was driving a cab in Allentown. That's another story. I've always cherished the carved cab and always will. It's a tangible remembrance among all the memories of him I have. Thinking of him makes any day brighter. Thank you for the opportunity to share my memories and wishing Frank's family all the best. You lost a wonderful person, Fred and Tanya Richter. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Let me introduce myself first. My name is Frank Fan. This is my wife, Linda. This is my son, Zilin. Today, I would like to say that Frank was our best friend and a very good teacher to my son, Zilin Fan. The first time we met him was at the flea market in Lancaster, when my son showed some interest in his collection of fossils and gems. Frank had the patience to answer a nine years old boy's questions and showed him how to split a fossil with some tools. He showed a tremendous amount of passion in teaching children about geology. We had a very pleasant experience in working with Frank at a summer camp held in 2018. He was a very good teacher and the campers who came from China were so impressed by Frank's knowledge of geology, his incredible caving experience, his passion for children, uh, education, and his candidates as well. During our summer camp, Frank showed us the new house he was building. It's a fabulous house where we could see Frank's thought of idea, his the great design and the daily work. Everyone loves the house so much and everyone loves Frank so much. Frank is a very kind, decent and a friendly man. 
He is always waiting to help others. I still remember when he heard that a friend of mine in Allentown had some troubles with his chimney. He drove from Lancaster to Allentown just to check my friend's chimney. Since at that time, we just moved to Pennsylvania. We didn't have a lot of friends here. Frank was a true friend who always gave us a hand when we needed it. We are all so grateful for Frank's friendship and his kindness. Even today, I still can't believe we will never see Frank again. We miss him so much. We miss him and love him forever. Thank you. I was getting ready to do this at home um, in the house and I thought that it really made a lot more sense to be outside both for me and for Frank. So um, I'm up at the reservoir near our house, which is one of my favorite places to hang out outdoors. I have some notes, I'm probably going to use them, um, and uh, anyway. So I feel like Frank Hersig was always in the process of either creating a great story or telling a great story, and I guess those two go hand in hand, so that makes sense. Um, he lived from the heart with this kind of enthusiasm that was really hard to ignore, and a love for life and for people that was really contagious. A lot of my best memories from that high school period, which is when our paths most overlapped, um, a lot of those memories, those best, the best memories of those, per that period, um, involve Frank. From times learning my very first tries at learning to lead, I think, with the ecology club at school, to being introduced to caving, which was a totally new uh, and challenging experience, and one that honestly changed my life, I think. Um, he played a really large role in introducing me to the idea of conservation and to my love for nature and the outdoors, which have definitely been formative things in my life. Um, he was a believer in getting out there and doing stuff, uh, not just talking. He was a fan of saying what you meant um, and doing what you believed in. And I'm really thankful that a bit of his adventurous spirit seems to have rubbed off on me. Um, he did learn me. He did teach me to repel from the ceiling of his classroom over lunch. I immediately got my hair stuck in the repel device, which I guess is why you start small. Um, he was able to push the table underneath me. I stood up, freed my hair, but it's a lesson I've never forgotten. Um, ultimately, I was able to graduate to the back of the stadium bleachers, and eventually, I was repelling into caves. And um, that's actually. Repelling is actually a skill that I still use to this day on a regular basis as a member of a search and rescue team here in Colorado. So, Mr. Hersig will always have a special place in my heart um, and I'll always be grateful for his role in helping me to figure out who I am and what I care about at that time in your life where you're really, um, you're really deciding that. Um, and I appreciate him encouraging me to, uh, once I knew those things, to not be a wuss and to get out there and do what I needed to do. I am grateful to have known him and thankful that our paths crossed, um, and I'm really sad that he's gone. Additionally, I feel like I should mention that every single Hersig that I have met is inspiring, and I love you all, and I am sending you huge hugs. Hi, my name's Greg Hackenberg. I got to get to know Frank probably over 40 years ago when I became a teacher and a coach at Garden Spot. Um, wrestling and football were very close to Frank's heart and those were the two sports that I coached. Um, and getting to know him over the years it was such a pleasure. Um, when any any time Frank's name came up in a conversation, you know, you'd get a smile out of somebody, and it seemed like everybody had some kind of a Frank story. Um, he was definitely one of a kind. 
and the stories could go on and on about some of the stuff that him and I did together as well as some of the other stories I've heard over the years. You know, Frank was always the first one to jump in and help when anybody needed any kind of help. Um, he lived a great life, an honorable life, and I truly enjoyed his lifelong friendship. He always had words of encouragement for people, especially the athletes, mm, telling them not only what they wanted to hear, but Frank was the kind of person that would tell you what you needed to hear. Um, just a unique individual. Going to miss him tremendously. And I'm so sorry for his loss. Um, we'll see you again, Frank. I'm here in Nantucket, Massachusetts, which is a beautiful island uh, south of the Massachusetts Cape. And I've been here all week vacationing with my friends, but I've been thinking about Frank Kersig a lot this week and just wanted to say a few words about him. So I had, I had Frank in ninth grade for my earth science class and I have to say he was a very encouraging teacher um, I didn't know it at the time but he really probably was the first person to introduce geology or earth science to me as as a as a science and Although I went to college for med school, I ended up switching to geology and became a geologist. And, you know, I don't have a direct link to my uncle, Uncle Frank, who is both my teacher and a family member, encouraging me into the sciences, but I can say he didn't discourage me into the sciences too. And as many teachers will know, a lot of kids can be discouraged into certain topics because of the teachers or the professors that they have. So I do have to thank him for that. Um, and because of that shared love for geology, we had a lot of discussions about fossils and rocks and the, the earth as a system. And he told me a lot of stories about his caving expeditions and we had a lot of great conversations that uh, that I had throughout the years that I'm sure ran in my veins to some degree while I uh, ended up choosing geology as a major. The thing I remember about uh, Mr. Hersig, my uncle Frank, was that he really sort of lit up a room when he came in. He was always goofing around and smiling and um, I don't think I've ever seen him angry. He was always laughing and making jokes uh, and, and just bringing a lot of life to my family events and other places I saw him. So for that, that I'm really grateful too. So, although I don't know if he ever made it to Nantucket Island to a beautiful environment like this, I know he would have loved it. Um, and I'm really loving it too. And I know he'll be missed by our family. Okay, so um, one more story I forgot to mention before was that when I had Frank for earth science class. Uh, I was uh, I was in ninth grade and Mount St. Helens had just erupted, which was May 18th of, oh gosh, 1980. It's been a while. And I remember a few of my friends and I decided, it might have been for extra credit or just because we like to sing and do music, 
Um, we made a Mount St. Helens eruption song, and I don't remember the music we used. It was obviously the melody from a pre-existing song, but we wrote we wrote words about the eruption of Mount St. Helens, and um, I'm sure it was very lame and you know kid kid music, but I do remember uh, Frank was really encouraging and he loved it you know we laughed about it and he praised us for spending time writing a song about geology and um, that stuck with me too just just the fact that a teacher uh, with some lame you know ninth grade students could could encourage something like that um, that that takes a special teacher to uh, encourage kids even when they are just kids and, uh, and that was a nice thing he did too and I, I'll never forget the date of the eruption because I think that was part of the lyrics um, even though I do forget the melody and most of the rest of the song um, I, I remember him being really thrilled that some of his students cared enough about this geologic event to write a um, an ash deposit volcanic eruption song Hi, my name is Melissa Thomas Van Gundy. I graduated from Garden Spot High School in 1985. And here are some things I remember about Frank Hersick. Our ninth grade science class was Earth Science and taught by Frank Hersick. His classroom was crammed full of National Geographic magazines, rocks, minerals, fossils, books, and many boxes of treasures he couldn't bear to throw away. A bit Renaissance cabinet meets cur of curiosities meets hoarder. He was engaging and challenging and fun, but also might throw an eraser at your head if you weren't paying attention. If you needed to go to the bathroom, you had to identify one of the rocks he used as a hall pass before you could go. He was fair. You could you get help from your classmates if you were in dire need. Most of the time, these weren't small chunks that geologists call hand samples. They were pieces that took two hands to carry. And you had to re remember the, the rock identif to identify the rock when you returned from the bathroom as well. I learned so much in that class. From age 15 to 18, just three years which now goes by in a flash, I was generally doing something outdoorsy. Hersick led a camping trip to West Virginia nearly every year, five days of camping and caving, crawling through mud and dust. I went to 1983 and 1984 and was a bit upset that he canceled the 1985 trip. I think he was on sabbatical, maybe, I don't care, I was just angry that I wasn't getting to go to West Virginia. But my mom was happy because I went to senior prom like a normal person. The trips were in the spring. And I turned 16 on one, so that would have been in early May of 1983. My mom secretly sent along birthday cake, and Hersick, fearing it wasn't enough for everyone, brought more cake along, so we ate cake for breakfast for four days. To prepare for these trips, you had, we had to learn a few knots and learn to repel and ascend, although I don't remember having to climb too high. I think we went off the bleachers uh, in the, at the football field off the back. We learned figure eight and prussic knots and how to make a seat harness out of webbing. I think I could still tie the knots, but I've lost the skill of making a seat harness. Of course, we would have already covered cave formation in class, but we also learned about West Virginia geology. It's a bit hazy, but I'm pretty sure we had to learn to read topographic maps and use a compass and, and learned about the Monongahela in, in the, also. In, and in class, Hersick would have covered the history of environmental science, including the difference between conservation and preservation when talking about a national forest versus a national park. And on one of those trips to West Virginia, we stopped at the supervisor's office in, of the Monongahela National Forest in Elkins, West Virginia. After seeing that building and stopping and talking, looking at the maps, and we probably picked up some more topo maps, I decided I wanted to be a forester on the Monongahela National Forest. And here I am. I have a PhD in forestry. I'm a research forester on the Ferno Experimental Forest, which is part of the Monongahela. And before that, my career was also on the, as forester on the Monongahela National Forest. It's kind of a boring career story, but it's all thanks to Hersick bringing me to West Virginia. So we live in Elkins right now. Um, yeah, so my time with him in high school uh, really shaped who I am. He taught me confidence in myself. I wasn't athletic, so learning to cave and go and those camping trips just gave me the confidence in my physical abilities. He gave me confidence in my intellectual abilities and that it was okay to be smart, that it was okay to keep questioning and, and searching for answers and being curious about the world were things that he really taught, 
taught me that we're important and should be supported. He was the first person to introduce me to the idea of deep time and geology, the formation of caves, and just all the geomorphology uh, that we we were learned we were taught in that ninth grade class, which seemed some pretty high level concepts at the time that I still use in my work. Um, yeah, that just that shaped my view of the world, the natural world, and, and the human world. I really wish I'd kept more in contact with him. I regret that, and uh, uh, yeah, just uh, it's such a cliche thing to say, but thank you, Hersick family, for creating and supporting such a, a marvelous person and all the all the good he did in the world. This is from a letter from Barbara Meadows, Frank's cousin. Frankie was so full of life and happiness, his sudden and unexpected death left you no way to prepare for letting him go. Frankie's presence in my sister Kathy's and my life really made our childhood bearable, and I hope we did the same for his. I remember the boys, Frankie and Ronnie, taking us on their bikes to go blackberry picking, hunting for strawberries, and picking sour cherries to make pies. We also used to keep them company when they were busy building houses for their dad instead of playing ball or enjoying time with their friends. Frankie taught me Spanish when he was in high school and I was about five or six years old. They played card games with us and were like big brothers to us. How many teenage boys would want to willingly spend time with little six and eight year old girls? When my husband Frank died, Frankie came right up to make sure I knew how to protect myself and how to shoot a weapon correctly and safely. He was always very special to me and always will be. I will miss his smile, his wonderful sense of humor, and what a good and decent person I will always remember him as. Thoughts from Bob Homan. I had Frank as a teacher and coach in the 70s, and I had the honor of helping build his new house. I worked with Frank for two to three years until the end of his life. Buying building supplies from Walgamuth Auction in Brownstown, we would pack a 20-foot flatbed trailer full and drive the back rows to his house. Once or twice when we returned, the load, it would be hanging over the side of the trailer. It's amazing we made it back without a problem. Frank had some rare wood, wormy chestnut, he bought 40 years ago in West Virginia, and he stored it in a shed on his woodland property. He had to cut down a tree about 10 inches in diameter to get to the shed. The wood is now the floor of his living room. He obviously had the house in his mind for the last 40 years. When you needed something, check with Frank before you buy. As a carpenter, you just gotta love a guy like that. It sure seemed like everything was exciting to him. He loved GPS. He was amazed as a navigator. He would count down the feet to our next turn. Caving. He was part of a cave rescue crew. If someone would be injured in a cave, he had a backpack and equipment ready to leave in a moment's notice. Students and youth. He would give more than most people to teach or be a part of their lives. From being a school teacher to coaching to helping at sporting events, he was on the go all the time. As I said, I knew Frank for 50 years. I spoke with students of his that were 25 years younger than I. They said they didn't have the guts to mess around in his class because they weren't sure what he would do. He most definitely left his footprint on my heart. Hello, my name is Steve Franz. I've been the facilitator of the Great Decisions group at the Lidditz Library since 2016. I joined that group in 2000, late 2008 and went back and checked some records with Evie Berge and verified that Frank Hersick was uh, a charter member of the group. He joined in 2006, and so he was an active contributor for 15 years. And trust me, he is very much missed. We will miss him for, for more reasons than one. Whether he was talking about his uh, cave exploring exercises in Cuba, or whether he was talking to us about his, his uh, trials and tribulations of building an environmentally friendly house, including ordering six different kinds of sedum to put on the roof of the house, and he imported them from somewhere south of the Mason-Dixon line. I'm not sure where. Anyway, he joined in 2006. He could always be relied on as bringing a scientific mind to the activities of the day. And his last major contribution to the group was February the 12th, 2020, when uh, we facilitate, he facilitated uh, a group exercise with Dr. Alan Peterson, who is a local environmentalist, and the topic of the day was climate change. Frank could always be relied on a scientific evaluation of what was going on in the scientific community of climate change, of envir environmental issues 
etc., etc., etc. He will very much be missed. Uh, he could be relied on regarding his scientific background, especially in the geosciences. He was uh, an incredible contributor to our group for all of his 15 years. That's about what my testimonial is about. I thank you very much, and we miss him greatly. A letter from Ted Sargent, a good friend. I was at work when my phone rang and the caller ID showed Frank's name. As soon as I answered and heard Brinton's voice, I knew it was not going to be good news. I must admit, I was in shock when Brinton told me of Frank's passing. He couldn't have died. Frank was going to live forever. I told my boss I needed a little personal time, and I wandered around the plantation where I work, communing with nature and thinking about my best friend. Frank had lots of friends, many of whom he had known far longer than he knew me. So I doubt I was Fra Frank's best friend, but I have no doubt that he was my best friend. I first met Frank at a meeting of the York Grotto chapter of the National Speleological Society, where I had gone to request assistance with my Boy Scout Venture Patrol. Of all the members, Frank stood up and said he'd be happy to help us out. It was only weeks later that I discovered how close to Frank I lived. I like to think that was a foreshadowing of how close we came to be to each other over the years. What started for me as a way to help my son's Boy Scout pals turned into a passion for caving, which I acquired from Frank. We would ride together to York Grotto monthly meetings, and he would regale me with stories of the sugar shack days, his early days of caving in West Virginia with his many close friends. But I'm happy to say that caving was only one of the many ways Frank and I shared our friendship. Another way was cutting and selling firewood. Well, Frank sold it. I helped him out in return for getting wood for my own needs. He was fond of saying, let's go up the woods. It was very pleasing to me that Frank felt free to ask me to take care of his wood customers when he had his bypass surgery. And I loved his land up the woods, the incredible Appalachian Rocky woodlands that he used for hunting wood and collecting junk. The first time he took me up the woods, I couldn't believe the assorted piles of cement blocks, metal sheets, fencing, old cars, and other crap he had all over the place. He insisted it was all valuable and that someday he would have need of it. And that doesn't count the trailers full of stuff he collected for his stand at Shoop's Grove. Let's face it, Frank was a hoarder. Many were the times I'd sit him down and try to explain that he wasn't making any profit for all the time he spent on ships and that there was no need to fill his house with more and more boxes of his treasures. I can still remember the day Karen confided to us that she longed for the days when she could play the piano that now was so covered by Frank's boxes she couldn't even see the keyboard. But Frank had the last laugh when out of all the piles of gold he fashioned the dream house he had promised Karen. The first time I saw it, I was blown away. Still, Frank was not much of a businessman. He had too generous a nature. It was something we shared. Time and again, we would get involved in what I like to call reverse haggling. For instance, when I wanted to buy a geo from him, he said to give him $2,000. I said, no, no, it's worth at least $2,500. He would come up and I would come down. And like most hagglers, we would meet in the middle. But it was where we started from that I know used to drive my wife crazy and probably did the same for Karen. But for us, it was natural. It was, it was what friends do. Here are a couple of other stories that illustrates Frank's character. And he was a character. Sometime in the 1980s, I took my kids hiking in the Grand Canyon. We spent a day hiking down the Kaibab Trail to the bottom of a Phantom Ranch, and then we climbed up to the higher north rim over the next two days. When we returned home, I was telling Frank about this hike, and he agreed it was a wonderful hike. Then, without an ounce of braggadocio, he told me how he and Brinton had done the same hike when she was in her teens, but they had started at the crack of dawn and finished the same evening. Now, normally, if someone told me that, I would counter that at such a pace, many details and side items would have been missed. But if you knew Frank, you know that he didn't miss anything. In fact, I'm confident he saw more than I did. Frank loved big equipment, most of all his tracked front end loader. When I wanted to install a garage on my property, he offered to bring up this huge machine to prepare the land. As he was scooping up large quantities of dirt, I noticed and asked him about the gravel and murky water in the bucket. Turns out we had broken through my drain field, which I thought ran down the hill, but in reality ran across the hill. Due to that, plus a week of rain, we created a quagmire instead of a firm foundation. We had gravel trucked in to no avail. Then we tried fist-sized gravel, but the cat still sunk in. Finally, it was up the woods for basketball-sized boulders by the pickup load that worked. 
To this day, my wife complains that we bought $2,000 worth of rocks and not one of them was a diamond. The last time I saw Frank was at my son's wedding. He and Karen showed up and I hurried out to the parking lot to greet them. With a serious face, Frank explained that he didn't want to make a scene, but was it all right that he was wearing his Trump button? While I was surprised, I assured him that it was wonderful to see him, and as always, he could do anything he wanted. Then, with that crazy gap tooth grin of his, he drew back his sport coat to reveal his F dot 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 Trump button. My name is Ralph Pritch. Uh, I asked Frank to be my best man when I got married. Frank walked into my life at the start of my sophomore year in college, his freshman year. We were roommates for a semester until he moved to the sugar shack at the top of the hill across the street from the campus. We hit it off right from the start. Our like and respect for each other only grew with the passing of time. We both had old world fathers who were stern taskmasters who were heavily involved in the building trades. We earned our money for college by starting at a young age working for our fathers. I can't bring myself to talk about the crazy funny pranks that Frank and I shared during our three years at Kutztown. I can only think of the tragedy that he couldn't enjoy his house for a much longer period of time. I do take solace in knowing that he was happy, dreaming, planning, and gathering materials to build his dream. He outdid his father by a country mile. His father would be proud, or maybe even jealous of Frank's masterpiece. It is a work of art. It is his legacy. It is his gift to his wife and family and it is a marvelous piece of work for a retired teacher and coach. My husband, John Helter, and I knew Frank for a number of years. We first met each other at local wrestling matches. Frank kept score for Garden Spot High School. I kept score for Cocalico High School, and John was a wrestling official. We often worked together. Frank and I, and also John, worked District 3 tournaments, sometimes sectionals, but Frank graduated to the District 3 finals along with John and me. Now, he didn't want to touch the computer. That worried him a lot, but he was a good tapper. Now, a tapper is the guy who goes out onto the wrestling match near the end of a period and counts down from three, two, one, time. In case the official doesn't hear the buzzer, that is a big help. Frank developed his own system. 14 seconds from the end of the period, stand up, get your bearings, walk out onto the mat, staying on the skirt, put yourself with the official between you and the clock. Keeping watch on the clock, count back four, three, two, one, time. Frank was very efficient at this. He taught a number of people how to do it promptly and correctly. After we were involved in District 3 wrestling, we got the chance to work NCAA. Our first opportunity was at Franklin and Marshall. There was a qualifying tournament for the NCAA finals in wrestling. From there, we got invited to the University of Pennsylvania. They have an annual Keystone Invitational where various colleges are invited to participate in their tournament. We made a lot of good friends there and we had a good time. Now, whenever we 
stayed overnight at a tournament, usually districts. We shared a hotel room. Two beds, of course, but it worked out for us. However, the last time we worked at Hershey, Frank's unpacked and then said, oh, I forgot my pajamas. Uh, that's all right. Kathy won't mind, will you, Kath? I thought about it. I didn't mind, but I did notice that I didn't have my pajamas either, so I beat it to Kmart 15 minutes before it closed and bought a really cheap, ugly pair of pajamas so that I wouldn't be like Frank. Now, as we traveled to the Keystone Invitational and other NCAA tournaments, we passed rocks. Frank told us all about rocks. We learned about rocks in the Pleistocene era. We learned how they were created. We learned how long they might have been in a certain location. He loved what he taught. He loved rocks and he loved caving. Now, Frank was a modest guy, but he let a story drop recently regarding his caving experience. Now, yes, he traveled all over the world to go into caves, but this particular case was in a cave up near Kutztown, and Frank led the team on a rescue mission for two college students who were trapped in a cave. Back to wrestling, in 2017, Frank was awarded a place in the Lancaster Lebanon Wrestling Hall of Fame. He was so proud to be inducted and we were proud of him. After that, he graduated to EIWA tournaments, which were qualifiers for Division I National Championship for the NCAA. And we traveled to Lehigh and to Brown and to Hofstra and to Binghamton, New York and a number of other places, always with the same group of people and we made good friends. The highlights of our working NCAA tournaments were two championships. Frank and I got to work the New York Championship, which was held at Madison Square Garden in 2016 it was three days of fun. We had an apartment and uh, shared it with Frank and, two, and another guy. And every night after wrestling, we went back to our apartment. Now, the one thing nice about having Frank along at a tournament is he knew where the hospitality room was. And Frank got hungry often. In fact, often on the way home, he would say, do you need anything to eat? Because Frank would take the leftover brownie, the leftover donut, whatever, and take it home with him. The next big tournament that the three of us worked was in Pittsburgh and we had the best time. We all drove out and we met at the venue, the Pittsburgh Paint Arena and got our credentials and then went to our apartment. We stayed in Heinz Loft, which was a part of the original Heinz Pickle Factory, Heinz Soup Factory, Heinz Baked Bean Factory. And we had three bedrooms and a fold-out couch 
and three bathrooms, and we had a good time. I know I said that once already. The first night, we went out to dinner at the Pittsburgh Brewery across Ohio River Boulevard and enjoyed some of their beer and their good food. We also uh, spoke highly of the staff at the tournament because their courtesy people were the best. Frank saw a number of coaches that he recognized. Some of them didn't recognize him back, but he knew them all, and he knew the names of all the wrestlers. And when we finished there, it was kind of the icing on the cake for Frank and me. Then there was the house. I believe it was started in 2016. Uh, of course, first there were rocks. And then Frank had a bulldozer, so he did a lot of the grading himself. They poured the concrete floor, and we would go to a tournament, and people would say, Frank, is your house finished yet? He would say, no, not quite. <clears throat> the house was unique. Frank and Karen designed it. It would suit his needs perfectly. And of course, rocks were involved. Well, several years later, in fact, just this year, 2021, the house was finished and the move-in began. A little slow at times, but that's the way it goes. Well, Frank, you got to speak and shake hands with Bo Nickel. You talked to a lot of coaches. You made a lot of friends and acquaintances at those tournaments, and you will not be forgotten. We all miss you, Frank, but we know you're hanging around us somewhere. Thanks, Frank. Remembering Frank Hersig from Dean Snyder. The York and Greater Allentown Grottoes and the NSS, National Speleological Society, lost one of their most loyal members when Frank Hersig died suddenly on March 1, 2021. Frank was a dedicated Grotto member for over 35 years for both Grottoes. I first met Frank on a cave trip to West Virginia in the mid-1970s. He was driving a windowless van with no passenger seats. Six of us left after school, we were both public school teachers, and stopped in Lancaster County at a potato chip factory where, where Frank knew the owner. We left with a large tin of chips. Several hours later, we stopped at Shenandoah Caverns, where we spent the night in our sleeping bags and under their pavilion. The next morning, we were greeted by the cave manager, Mr. Daniel Proctor, who seemed to be upset at our presence. But this was just a show, as Frank and Proctor were good friends. We spent the day at the cave and didn't leave for camping and caving in West Virginia until late in the afternoon. We arrived late in the day at Dallas McKeever's farm and had a great weekend visiting caves in the area. Frank attended over 25 NSS conventions and was well known to other attendees. He always enjoyed the geology sessions. He was a fixture at OTR, the old timers reunion for cavers, and was way beyond being a coot. He was always seen at the OTR yard sale where he sold rocks, minerals, and used cave boots. Those boots have seen hundreds of miles of caves, cave passages. There will never be another Frank. He was the ultimate con conservationist and recycler. He could do more with less than anyone I have ever met. When he was working as a science teacher at Garden Spot High School, a storm hit while the building was under construction. It tore away the insulation and deposited it all around the neighborhood. Frank made a deal with the contractor that he could keep the insulation if he collected it. At the Marengo, Indiana NSS convention, he forgot to put his clothes bag into the car. He spent the week dressed in his cave clothing, only buying a pack of underwear and a pair of socks at the local Walmart. Frank was involved in several cave projects. When Red Church Cave was gated in the early 1980s, he drove a pickup truck to carry sand for the concrete work. He visited Romania in 1988 with an early American group to visit caves there. He was one of 17 cavers on the NSS ISS expedition to Iceland in 1994. Frank was an excellent cave explorer and an even better friend. We will all miss his smile and good nature. 
I consider Mr. Hersig one of the great influences in my life and the world is emptier without him in it. His enthusiasm for the natural world was infectious and as an ecology club member at Garden Spot High School, I was hooked and interested in learning everything he could teach me. A highlight, of course, was the annual ecology club field trip that took us on caving adventures in Virginia and West Virginia. Those of us who were lucky enough to participate in those trips could recount stories for hours, I'm sure. Choosing just one is hard, but the one I'd like to share comes after I graduated from high school. I chose to go to college in West Virginia and study the environmental sciences because I so loved the area and the cave that Mr. Hersig introduced to me. I continued to engage with the Ecology Club and meet the caving group throughout my time in college. Mr. Hersig invited me to chaperone the field trip the spring I graduated from college. I was very excited and immediately said yes. The issue was that the trip conflicted with my college graduation ceremony. I was happy to miss it. My mother was not happy. She went to talk to Mr. Hersig about it directly to let him know she did not want me to miss my graduation. I don't know what happened during that conversation. I only know the result. I got to chaperone the trip and all of the students on that field trip came to my college graduation. It meant so much to me that Mr. Hersig was willing to find a compromise and that he was there for my graduation too. This is the story I think of first when I think of him and one of the many reasons I will always be thankful that I was lucky enough to know him. Recently, I had an opportunity come up that I would have loved to have been able to share with him. I'm a research hydrologist with the United States Geological Survey. I study toxic cyanobacteria and don't have much opportunity for caving these days. However, not too long ago, I got a call from a colleague who is studying the lamp and flora and water quality in mammoth caves and thinks there may be some toxic cyanobacteria there. He invited me to come down to talk with his students and assist them with their field work. Next fall, I will be doing research in Mammoth Cave. That this opportunity was presented to me reflects Mr. Hersey's influence and encouragement. I am sure I will be thinking of Mr. Hersey and even sharing a few stories about him while I am there. I was fortunate to know Frank as uh, a student, an athlete, and also more recently as a coach. Uh, thinking back as a student, by the time I got to high school, uh, Frank was to the point of substituting, but he was my favorite substitute. Uh, I just remember knowing when I walked in, if he was a substitute, we were gonna be doing a little more than we would with a typical substitute. Um, and it was gonna be a lot of fun. But I also remember him just uh, messing with me, uh, having fun, uh, kind of playing tricks on me, like knowing I was on the wrestling team. And I remember he, he would do stuff like have me carry my actual chair with me to go to the bathroom as my hall pass. And he told me I had to keep my arms outstretched the entire time with the chair out in front of me. Uh, and he said, it w he said I had to do this because it would build my upper body strength and help me with wrestling and also build strength of character and mental toughness. But mostly I think he just got a kick out of, out of messing with, with one of the wrestlers. Um, so many little stories like that I could go on and on, but coming back as a coach uh, to Garden Spot, Frank just added uh, so much entertainment to long trips, long tournament trips in the vans, telling stories, always had incredible stories to tell. Um, and then also sometimes he would get on a, a science tangent and start talking about uh, the hardness ratings of rocks and uh, different types of woods. He was particularly uh, fond of cypress. And he could talk about Cypress Wood for like 10 or 15 minutes. So those maybe weren't quite as interesting as his, his amazing stories. But he was so uh, enthusiastic about those things and passionate about those things that it made you get interested in them as well. His, his enthusiasm for everything he did was contagious. Um, he, he One thing I remember, one particular van ride that I remember, he wasn't afraid to, to mix it up with the kids and, and joke around with the kids. Uh, we had one particular guy on our team who was known for his trash talk abilities. He would uh, just pretty much rip or roast everybody on the team. But he did, you know, everyone loved him, but he, but he had, just had a way of always having a good comeback. Always uh, just, he, he, would, he would rip you and you just couldn't, you couldn't come back with anything that would get him. 
Uh, but he, he started to, for one, for some reason on the way home from Carlisle, he started on Frank and, and what went, what transpired was about a 35 to 40 minute, uh, roasting battle that just had by the end, the entire band howling with laughter. And I, I don't, I wish I remembered what Frank, what the final, uh, blow Frank laid was, but whatever he said, I just remember that, that guy being speechless for pretty much the first time ever. Uh, and the entire van just erupting and declaring Frank the winner. Um, so just stuff like that. He just was truly one of a kind. He's left a legacy at Garden Spot of, to Garden Spot athlete, Athletics of consistency, uh, service, and stability. He's just truly a selfless person. Um, just coming back here to coach at Garden Spot, it was such a comfort uh, to, to have him still here running the scores table, running our scorebook. Uh, doing doing scouting reports, which he did in an in incredible legendary detail, uh, down to like color coding, uh, which guy was wearing red and, and green on the notes. And they were often written on the back of old programs because Frank was always uh, saving everything and wanted to waste nothing. Uh, and I just remember him going over with the scouting reports with me with like just such uh, excitement and also like the secrecy pulled me off to the side and he would be telling me then like he was giving uh, you know giving me the nuclear codes or something and uh, I just I'll never forget stuff like that I actually wish I wish I had appreciated it even more during the time that that it was going on um, Frank was just a truly selfless person like I said and he never made it about him uh, he, he put so much time into all, all the sports that he was dedicated to and, and particularly with wrestling. He just, nothing seemed to ever make him happier than just seeing us succeed, seeing the guys reach their goals and do so with, with class and represent Garden Spot in, in a strong way. Uh, my last memory of Frank uh, is at the district tournament. He was, of course, as he, as he always was, was running a table, giving his time, um, and he had actually run uh, the tournament helped run the tournament the day before um, for the for the college EIWAs. Um, so he's going back to back, and it, it was I think the day before or, or two days before he passed. And it was at the district tournament. We had two guys battle back to take third and qualify for states. And I didn't get to talk to him much that day because I was running around coaching and he was busy at his table. But I just remember as we were heading out, we were we were sitting there gathering our things up, and he kind of just buzzed by on his way out slapped me hard on the back, held up two fingers for two guys going to States and gave me a big thumbs up and a, and a big ear to ear grin. Um, and that's, that's the last memory I have of Frank. And that's the way I'd love to remember him. Uh, just a guy who truly um, cared about everything he put himself into and just always, uh, always put others first and put the programs he was involved with first, never made it about himself. Uh, just truly a one of a kind guy. So Frank will be greatly missed uh, and things just won't be the same uh, in our program without him. From Brian Hipschman. In the fall of 1969, I met Frank, then Mr. Hersig, as a seventh grader. Through the next six years, Frank would be a big part of my education as he brought his unique personality to the classroom and beyond. He spearheaded school trips to Lewis, Delaware, Wallops Island, and was a brave soul who allowed a bunch of students to go on a Sikh school trip to West Virginia for caving and geology study. After high school, Frank and I became friends, and I visited them while they still lived in Akron before moving to Bowmansville. He introduced me to caving, and he sold me a piece of his beloved woodland to build our home on. My kids grew up never knowing it when Frank might show up at our door, needing some help with firewood or dragging a deer out of the woods. When he would sit and chat in our living room, you never knew if there was a dead squirrel or rabbit in his backpack. There are long lasting memories of Frank, from stuffing junior high students who didn't listen into the trash can beside his desk, to helping him chaperone high school trips to West Virginia, and him making jelly bean stew because he didn't bring any food along on a caving trip to West Virginia. I did all the cooking after that. I will remember Frank for his love of the woods, caving, and his vibrant personality. May he rest in peace. From Chris Wilson, I was in seventh grade when Frank helped me into the Junior High National Honor Society. I was in homeroom with him studying earth sciences. Later, I was also in 10th grade homeroom. We went caving together in the Bone Norman Cave System in West Virginia. We went on countless adventures together. 
Skip forward a few years, and Kurt, my husband, and Frank worked on our roof in Lake George. Frank went off to Salida, Colorado, and Karen Brinton and our three children, Brittany, Bethany, and Ben, were at Garden of the Gods. Frank and Kurt joined up with us again to have fun at the Flying W Ranch. Frank, Karen, and Brinton took a road trip to Alaska together and spent the night in a tent on our Lake George property. Frank and I drove up to Cottonwood Pass. Kurt took his car with our two kids. Ben was in the Coast Guard at the time. Frank went down to Aspen and we turned around at the pass. We renovated Brian Hipschman's property and put a new roof on it. Kurt was working with Frank on the repairs. Ben and Sarah and their three kids, James, Jed, and Jules, collected fossils together at the Hersig home. Frank was a blessing to us all. He will be treasured in our hearts forever. Blessings, Kurt and Chris Wilson. From Peggy Ann Zern, Frank's cousin. I remember all the fun times that I had with all the cousins when we would get together in Pennsylvania. One of the things we would do was go to a school that had an outside electrical outlet and plug in our record player and put on our 45s and dance away on the blacktop. Also had a lot of good times at Willow Park swimming or at the amusement part of the park. Sometimes when there was a storm coming in the summer, we would put on our bathing suits and just run around in the rain until we heard thunder and then had to go inside. I always looked forward to our trips to Pensy and seeing the family. Those were good times. My love and my condolences to all. Hi, this is David Cahuth, longtime friend of uh, Frank Hersig. Uh, thinking way back, I first met Frank in 1975 at Dallas McKeever's uh, while I was on a caving trip. I kept in contact with Frank for a couple of years after that. And then in 1980, after I graduated from college, I found myself moving to Lancaster County and becoming somewhat of a neighbor of Frank's. About that time, 1980, I also discovered the Village Nightclub in Lancaster, PA, and the house band there called the Sharks. And about that time, I invited Frank to come along and see the Sharks. So we headed in there one night, paid our cover charge, and went and got a table uh, for the show. When the band came out, Frank right away exclaimed, that's one of my students up there. And it turned out that Dave Schaefer, the bass player for the Sharks, was a former student of Frank's. So after the first set, we head backstage and ask the uh, security people to get Dave Schaefer. He comes down, meets us, and takes us back and introduces us to the band, which paid dividends for me in later years because I got to know all those guys and had the all-area access pass, and that worked with some of the larger bands that they uh, played with in the ensuing years. Well, we had a good time that night, and a few weeks or a few months later, I can't remember, that was over 45 years ago, I invited Frank down again. So he accepted the invitation, and we headed down to the village, and we go in and pay our cover, or well, I paid my cover, and walked past the bouncers who were 6'5 to 6'8. They had some pretty big boys down there. And I go into the club and find a table, and I'm sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. And I'm wondering, what's wrong with Frank? So I head back out, and there the security guys are with Frank, and uh, they're objecting to his age. So Frank had those boyish looks back then, and being pretty short uh, didn't help the matter, but he had a Pennsylvania driver's license, and this was pre-photo ID, and it said he was 34, 35 years old. And I can remember the one bouncer said, the next time you borrow somebody's ID, try to get somebody a little closer to your own age. So Frank was steadfast that, no, that's actually my ID. That's me. I'm old enough and blah, blah, blah. I could see this wasn't going anywhere. So I had to think quick. So uh, I went back into the club, ran back to the stage door and started pounding and asked for Dave Schaefer. Got Dave Schaefer, Frank's former student, took him out, and he explained the situation to the bouncers. And uh, it, was, it was quite humorous at the time. And uh, I didn't really remind Frank about it. I, I just thought of this the other day after Brinton asked me uh, to tell a story about her father. So that was, uh, that was it. That was a lot of fun back then. Uh, after I received the sad news about Frank, I called uh, one of our longtime acquaintances, Jane L. Graham, in Buckeye, West Virginia, and told her what had happened. And she, explained, she ex exclaimed that it was the end of an era. So I think it's kind of remarkable for someone to define uh, an era, but uh, Frank was really that kind of guy, and we're going to miss him. Rest in peace, Frank. Well, hello. Uh, this is Dennis Buckenmeyer. Um, I've been asked to offer some memories of Frank's 
Frank Erksen. Um, I'm going to try and do that. This is unrehearsed and I am unadorned. I hope I've chosen a, an appropriate background. Um, I, and I need to preface all of this from the fact that my knowledge of Frank has to do with being a fellow member of the Birch Mineralogical Society and maybe even one of the nearly founding members of it. Um, so, and I came along a little bit later, but you know, the thing about Frank was, and the reason I, none of this is rehearsed or practiced is Frank may well have been one of the, the last of a breed, uh, an unpretentious, unassuming sort of person um, who, who was never plastic. Everything was very real about Frank, um, which is not to say that he couldn't help you find the humor in a bad situation that you may have found yourself in. He was quick to offer that, that little segue to, to get where uh, he wanted you to be. But at any rate, um, I'm trying to be real about Frank. Um, and, you know, Frank often struck me as, well, we were both into minerals and some people collect minerals from the standpoint of uh, it's a, an asset, it's a worth, it, it's something that makes me better. And yet, I think in Frank's mind, um, the more precious thing was knowledge and experience. And in Frank's mind, the only reason to have something was to share it or have a common point of interest about it with someone. It, it was not a self-serving need or desire or any of that. Uh, it was always very, very real. Now, all of this I need to temper a little bit with the fact that because Frank may have been a couple years ahead of me, he may have favored himself into some places that I'm very jealous of that he may have gotten into that I was never able to. Um, he kind of came along at about a time where mineral collecting was quite popular. Um, but uh, at any rate, um, his presence at the meetings was, was always incredible. And we could always count on Frank to offer something to us in the way of a, a program or a sharing of his experiences. Um, sometimes he'd relate something that we'd never heard before from some experience he's had in a cave. And while it might be hard to stretch the imagination of the commonality between wrestling and rocks. They did. I, I'm, I'm sure they both had a discipline, a discipline upon each other, um, which I, I know Frank at, at times has been called upon to um, assist in some cave rescues, and it requires certain physical ability to be able to do that. Um, but again, it was all a matter of for somebody else, for something bigger than Frank. And I, I don't know how better to get that across. Um, I know it was always very, very helpful um, to any members or anybody that was interested. And in particular, kids. Um, I, I think, like I say, for Frank, anything that was worth having was an experience or a, a learning event. Um, and he was, his reason to have them was to share them. And certainly he had a few. Um, so at any rate, um, what's coming down with the Brooks Neurological Society is um, none of us are getting younger. I myself am getting older and through the passing of other folks and their age related illnesses and all, I wind up being the person that kind of has all the duties and I'm no longer able to fill all those duties. Um, Frank would do what he could to fill in some corners and you know, Hey, uh, that's all good, but 
Um, there may be a co-joining of the BMS, or rather, I think the better word might be an enrichment of the BMS with another fellow state club that we can offer what they need and uh, they can offer for us what the remaining membership of the BMS needs. So, um, Frank, if you're looking down on any of this, bless us through this, okay? Um, it, it, it's a transfigurement, whatever they call it, uh, of how things have turned out. Um, at any rate, um, I don't have a whole lot more to add, uh, except to say it was great to know Frank. Um, and what an example to live by. Enjoy your day. Thank you. From Mary Ellen Mako Scarbona, Frank's cousin. I've been trying to decide where to start with my memories of Frankie, and it always comes back to one thing, his big, warm smile. His smile reminded me of my dad's smile, and dad always considered Frankie and Ronnie the sons he never had. Watching them together was always a fun time. Living in separate states, our families didn't see each other that often, but when we did, he was always smiling. I was sick a lot as a child, and Frankie always made time to play games or just sit and talk with me whenever we saw each other. I was reminded of this during our last phone call a few months before he passed. I left a message on his phone and he called me back about a week later. Even if the caller ID hadn't let me know who was calling, I knew that familiar, happy voice. One of my favorite movies as a child was Cinderella, and Gus Gus was my favorite character. I must have mentioned it a few times over the years because Frankie started the phone call with, Is this the girl who used to be called Gus Gus? That's how it was with Frankie. He spoke to you as if no time had passed, and he was so happy to see or to speak with you. I will always miss him, but every time I think of him, I will have a big smile first. My sympathies and love. Hi, my name's Brian Burkmeyer. Um, Frank called me Fuzzy. Um, always seemed to have a uh, nickname for many of the people that he was acquainted with. Uh, but I uh, met Frank or as it was to me, Mr. Hersig at the time uh, in my seventh grade or science class uh, back in 1967. And I had already had an interest in earth science, mostly in rocks. As a kid, I collected at a quarry close to my house in Blue Ball um, for fool's gold or pyrite and in fields around that area for the limonite that uh, came after the pyrite. We'd break them open on the sidewalk and find the gold on the inside to grow rich. But in any event, uh, I uh, showed uh, Mr. Hersig uh, some of the stuff that I had collected at the quarry. He was quite interested. And, uh, so we kind of hit it off. And um, so in any event, that uh, turned into many, many experiences through the rest of my high school year in both mineral collecting and caving. And so I'm here to uh, tell you a few of those stories uh, of the great times that I had with Frank. In 1968, Frank um, organized a caving trip over Christmas holidays to West Virginia. And uh, so I went along, uh, along with some of his friends and we stayed in a sugar curing shack of George Dallas McKeever's, now close to Marlington, West Virginia, and did a number of caves. And um, it was the first time I slept in a cave underneath some bats, but we did uh, one cave uh, called uh, the, the Bone Norman, and that cave connected. And so, uh, in any event, we were interested in doing that, but there was just this one uh, problem. There was a the passageway had this thing called the pinch and it was the tightest little crevice that you had to squirm your way through to get to the passage from one cave to the other and you had a 38 inch chest it wasn't going to happen so i was pretty portly but uh, after about a half an hour and uh, most of the uh, skin off my stomach uh, and frank pulling and uh, some friends pushing from behind i was able to get through the pinch and uh, finished our uh, caving uh, that uh, 
week uh, down in West Virginia, and we, we went down on many other um, Christmas vacations, uh, caving in West Virginia. In 1971, the NSS, National Speleological Society, had their convention in uh, Blacksburg, Virginia, at Virginia Tech. And so uh, Frank had his Volkswagen uh, bus and with the box on the top uh, with a hinge that we kind of looked like a coffin that we all slept in. And uh, uh, we went down to the uh, convention for the week and uh, for doing some caving. And uh, though a lot of people stayed in the dorms, we stayed in the campground, which was uh, close to the ag department. Well, uh, uh, needless to say, uh, besides the speakers and that, we did a lot of caving. And uh, uh, that area had uh, plenty of caves that were pretty much mud holes. And uh, being that the uh, campground was next to the ag department, uh, we were sure that at that, uh, seven o'clock when they uh, turned the uh, irrigation system on, um, most of the campground uh, stripped down uh, to basically nothing. I guess it was pretty streaky. And uh, that's where we had our showers was uh, amongst the um, fields of uh, uh, plants that was uh, not making the ag department very happy. My main interest was minerals and so did Frank interested in minerals. So we went to many of the local mineral clubs in York and Reading and in Harrisburg who held their meetings at the uh, William Penn Memorial Museum. This was before uh, 283 and 222 were put in. So uh, the trip to uh, Harrisburg was via 322. And um, Frank had gotten a little motorcycle. It was a street bike, but pretty small. And uh, so he and I, he decided we were going to Harrisburg to the mineral show on a Wednesday evening. It was uh, at the William Penn. And um, so he took off from Blue Ball, my house, and went up there and uh, uh, went to the meeting and uh, enjoyed all the rest of it. And on the way home around Cornwall, um, the lightning started, the winds were howling, and we got into a full um, summer uh, deluge uh, and that continued uh, for what seemed like hours uh, you know finally uh, getting out around Hinkletown but uh, we uh, I've never been I don't think I've ever been that wet in my life uh, we were all just drenched uh, but, uh, always always a good time and always a great experience Frank and I had a number of great mineral finds, but one in particular was an area, uh, a location called Whitehaven along the Lehigh River. And uh, it was famous for quartz crystals. And they would area, the location was closed because some people did some blasting to get the quartz crystals out and that. And it was uh, along a railroad bed and they abandoned the railroad, but they hadn't abandoned the uh, telegraph lines and poles. And uh, in that area, the late 60s, uh, copper was in short supply and uh, there was a affinity for uh, glass insulators. And so the locals were chainsawing down the telegraph lines and stealing the copper and the insulators. So the police were heavily guarding that uh, area. And so we uh, did uh, night trips in. Uh, at the dead of night after dark, uh, we'd uh, hike in uh, about two miles to the location and, and uh, by candlelight and carbide lamp, uh, dig for uh, the quartz crystals along this one seam up there and then backpack them out uh, before morning so we could uh, escape. Uh, so we did that two or three times and uh, did very well, but it was our uh, uh, late night uh, collecting episodes. I think the one thing uh, you have to say about Frank is his enthusiasm. He, he, he just was enthusiastic about anything, any task that was put before him, and, and nothing really uh, fazed him. He was, he was up for the challenge. And uh, so uh, in both in caving and mineral collecting, we did a lot of stuff that uh, m most uh, wouldn't uh, 
risk or try. And uh, I could hear in his voice that that continued uh, um, throughout his life, uh, even though uh, I had moved away and, and only saw him when uh, I was at mineral shows and reminisce about uh, old times. But uh, he was uh, just uh, so uh, so excited about the, the home that he was building and he was telling me about the lumber and uh, where he had gotten it and the rest of it and you could see that uh, none of that uh, had changed in, in Frank and uh, I think that uh, it was a real inspiration for me growing up and uh, I'm sure to a lot of uh, other of his students and uh, people that uh, were friends of Frank and uh, I, I want to conclude by saying he made me a, a, a better person. Um, thanks. Bye. My name is Jeff Culp and I am Frank's son-in-law and I am married to Brenton. Uh, we've been married for just over 21 years and we have two boys, Wade and Blaze, uh, ages 15 and 12. And one Frank story in particular that sticks out very fondly in my mind is a trip we took to Croatia in the summer of 2013. It was Brenton and myself and Frank and Karen and we were there for about two weeks and traveled all around Croatia and it was an amazing trip and I will never forget it. So Croatia is where Frank's father's side of the family comes from and one of the things that Frank wanted to do while there was search for his relatives. Uh, Frank had heard stories that his father had been there many years ago and met Croatian family there. Uh, well, Frank knew very little about his father's trip and his interactions on that trip. And we didn't have any addresses or names of family contacts there, just the name of the town that he is pretty sure that his father stayed at. Um, but we all know of Frank's determination and his adventurous spirit. So about a week into our trip in Croatia, we ended up at the town of Veliki Prolog. It's a beautiful village at the top of a hill overlooking a valley. It was a Sunday around noon and we arrived there. We got out of our small rental car and looked around and noticed that not many people were out and about, probably because it was a Sunday and people were at home with their families relaxing. Uh, but again, this didn't deter Frank one bit. So he knocked on the door of what looked to be a small local pub or restaurant and Frank knew a little Croatian but mostly just simple words and phrases and he had an English to Croatian translation book that he brought with him uh, that we're pretty sure he got at a garage sale like most of the things that Frank had and he used that during the trip so after he knocked on the door some people came to the door and Frank began to explain to them using the Croatian words that he knew for family and grandfather and father and of course Frank's last name Hersig, um, which we would come to find out that there were many Hersigs in this area of Croatia. So so even without knowing the language very well, Frank, you know, he had his charm, he had his smile, his confidence and his enthusiasm. And we all know these are the infectious uh, characteristics about Frank. So this family and a few of their friends, they invited us in, even though their restaurant was closed and they made an amazing lunch for us. Um, so after that, just next door, there was another pub and Frank approached a few guys that were there having a drink outside and again, started up a conversation or tried to start up a conversation with the little uh, Croatian that he knew and you know, telling him what we're trying to do there. And there was definitely a couple of times in the, the attempted conversations where there was some awkward silence and we're not sure if this was going anywhere. Uh, but of course, Frank broke through and he made a connection uh, through the language barrier. And we, we think we understood one of the guys say, hey, I think we need to go into the valley of this town called Prologue and meet somebody else down there that would maybe know more about Frank's dad's trip. But again, we still hadn't gained full trust with this person and they hadn't, they probably weren't fully trusting us and we weren't fully understanding each other, but we trusted Frank. So we got back in our car and we followed these two guys. Um, we actually crossed into Bosnia and Herzegovina and we're guessing that they put in a good word for us at the border since the border patrol let us go right through without a problem. Um, 
and I'm going to have to skip over a lot of the, uh, this trip, uh, the, the details of that day for the sake of time. But we got into Prologue and we met some Croatians there that spoke fairly good English. And they took us to all these different places in our hunt for Frank's family. Uh, we went to another restaurant. We went to an internet cafe. We went to a few other houses. And we met all these very friendly Croatians that gave us food and drinks. And they spent time with us. <laughs> And so eventually we were invited into the house of a family where it seemed like pretty certain that there was a direct family connection with Frank. But we're sitting around the table um, at this family's house and they had just made an amazing meal for us. And we're looking through these old Polaroids uh, in shoe boxes. And Brenton holds up this picture and yells out, Grammy! And here they had a picture of Frank's mom. So hugs all around, we're all so excited, and we come to find out that uh, Frank is directly related to this family. So this is a picture here of Frank's cousin Zoran and his wife Dusanka and their daughter Gabriella. And they invited us to stay overnight, um, and the next day they took us around their town and we met other family and friends of theirs. And again, we had more food and drinks. Uh, we went to a cemetery um, where we also learned more about Frank's family. And, of course, this amazing experience wouldn't have happened uh, if it wasn't for Frank's carpe diem attitude on life. So we miss you so much, Frank. My name is Stan, Stan Landis, and I was a roommate of Frank's in college. But before I go on and make more comments regarding Frank, let me begin by offering my deepest sympathy to Karen and Brinton. Frank was a good man. He was always excited to try something new and put lots of energy to making whatever he was doing a success. He must have been a wonderful teacher to his students with all his experiences, his love of subject matter, and his work ethic. I'm sure he worked them hard, but at the same time, his goal was for his students to learn. So Karen and Brinton know that he made his mark in the world. Those close to him knew his kindness and enthusiasm for life. I know you miss him. I still can't come to terms with his death. He will always be in my mind as a friend and as a roommate in college where we shared lots of good times. He was such a good friend that after he graduated from Kutztown in June, he decided to continue living in the apartment that we shared until I graduated in August. We needed to earn some money to pay for rent, food, and once in a while, some beer. We decided we would be caddies at the local country club, Berkeley Country Club. Neither of us had ever played golf, but we were determined to learn the game, or at least act like we knew how to play golf. We were very good at finding balls hit in the rough and gained quite a reputation for it. Our secret was to carry one or two of the golfer's balls in our pocket. So when we had to do the big search, after several minutes of dog-like techniques, lo and behold, we would drop the ball from one of our pockets, holler, here it is, and give it a good stomping so it would be in a depression when the golfer would come to, to us to take a look at the ball. One more story. Shortly after my wife Joanne and I were married, Frank came to visit us and determined that we needed a new kitchen and a new kitchen cabinets. And I told him, well, we couldn't afford a whole new kitchen. He said, well, then let's make some cabinets. We'll make them ourselves. He said that he would be at our home next Friday and will work during the weekend. Sounded good to me and I told him, let's do it. <clears throat> what a job. We would work after he arrived on Friday evening, many times until one or 2 a.m., sleep a little, get up and work most of Saturday. He would leave after dinner on Saturday and return for, I believe it was, three or four more weekends after that. We finally finished the project, and boy, were we proud. Half-inch plywood cabinets, hinges, and hardware Frank had salvaged somewhere. 
And I think back then, 1967, the total cost was something like $150. We worked hard together to complete the project, but we also laughed a lot. We were both beginning teachers and had lots of stories to relate to each other. Writing this and making a video has helped somewhat to come to terms with Frank's death. I hope what, what I have shared helps you as well. Thank you. I'm Cordell Musser and I knew Frank for many years. Uh, I have a lot of great memories of Frank that I'll never forget. I remember the first day I met Frank, I was in fourth grade and I uh, decided I wanted to try wrestling out. And uh, my dad took me in to the first day of practice and met Frank and explained to him that I had had my right leg amputated below the knee and wondered if it's okay if, if I could try it. And without hesitation, Frank said, absolutely, come on in. And from that time on, uh, Frank treated me just like anybody else, never gave me any special treatment, um, made me feel comfortable. And, you know, he's very instrumental in getting my wrestling career started on the right foot, which, you know, wasn't easy since I didn't have a right foot. So Frank had a sense of humor too. He would have liked that. Um, I often wonder what my life would have been like had Frank showed any hesitation that first day. So he was huge. In, in getting me started in wrestling. Um, I have so many memories and I'll just mention a few. Uh, one of the ones that come to mind, I made several trips uh, with Frank and with Coach Hale to States, just the three of us, and you really get to know those guys when you're away from school with them. But uh, I remember the first year we went, uh, Mr. Hale had an old Volkswagen bug that wouldn't start without push starting it. So whenever we wanted to go anywhere, he'd make Frank get out and push. I'd offer to help, but they, of course, wouldn't let me help. And every time it would start, as soon as Frank would go to get in, Mr. Hale would take off and so that Frank couldn't get in until Frank would start punching and kicking his car until he would stop. Um, another time, it was in the morning, and Frank and I were awake, and Mr. Hale was still asleep. I guess Frank decided it's time for Mr. Hale to get up. So he jumped on top of him and started bouncing on him and hitting him, telling him to wake up. And, for all those you know, who's, who know Mr. Hale, why uh, at that point I knew Frank was crazy. I said, I thought Mr. Hale was going to wake up and kill him. But uh, there's so many more memories I could go on and on, but um, Frank was just a great guy. He, he cared about everybody, uh, his students, his wrestlers. Um, he was always concerned also how I did in school. And, you know, the years following, when I'd see Frank, he'd ask about the family and the kids, and he always wanted to know, you know, how's their schoolwork, how are their grades, you know. He, he cared about them as well-rounded people. Um, we're all gonna miss him. Uh, he affected a lot of lives, and I um, just want to send my condolences to the family, uh, to Karen and the rest of the family. You know, he's, he was a great guy. He meant a lot to me uh, in my life, and uh, he's gonna be missed. Today would have been Frank's 77th birthday. He surely would have enjoyed all these reminiscences and probably have been embarrassed by, but definitely appreciative of all the accolades. Thank you all for participating in this tribute to Frank and for enjoying him for who he was, remembering his friendship, service, dedication, enthusiasm, adventures, knowledge, and stories. We all miss him.